Good evening, everyone. I uh, want to thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, this is our inaugural meeting of uh, the Canadian Association for Equality. Um, and we have, my, my name is Kevin Peterson, and uh, I'm on the national board. Of, and uh, and um, active in the uh, Vancouver branch as well. And um, we're very fortunate tonight to have uh, Professor Gunn here with us. And uh, he's going to be uh, talking to us about intimate partner violence. Thank you. Dr. Gunn. Thank you. <clears throat> I think what I'm going to do, I, I, I've got a lot of slides here. I, I, I think it probably makes sense to stop at a certain point and then I'll just sort of invite questions. And obviously we've got a small turnout, so I'd like to do what I can to make it as intimate as possible since it's intimate partner violence we're talking about. Um, I Very briefly, just so you know a little about who I am, I'm a research psychologist in the Department of Psychology at UBC and I've worked in the area of domestic violence as it used to be called since the 1970s. Um, I started out doing police training and then that morphed into doing court mandated treatment groups for men who'd been convicted of wife assault and then <clears throat> that morphed into uh, giving talks and doing research on the men in the treatment groups. I wrote a couple of books about the psychology of domestic violence which became fairly high profile and then I've, I've done a lot of talks since then. Continue to uh, write in the area specifically taking on what I call the gender paradigm, which I will, which you already know, believe it or not, even though you don't call it that, you already know what it is because it's been drilled into your brain. Um, so I will describe it for you tonight and uh, we'll talk about it. <clears throat> now, domestic violence has obviously been in the news lately. Uh, just last month, uh, Ray Rice was caught uh, on a videotape in an elevator punching his fiance, who married him two weeks later after he punched her. Um, and he was then fired by the team and there was a big media frenzy about it. Um, why the NFL didn't act sooner. It's not exactly clear what they want him to do, but I guess they want him to be fired. Anyway, uh, it is interesting to look at the cases that do come up before um, the media's attention. This is singer Chris Brown, uh, who was charged in March 2009 and later convicted of domestic assault on his girlfriend Rihanna and has had subsequent temper problems, but not with her. Okay. Um, Oprah, by the way, uh, in this, describing the Chris Brown case to Rihanna said this, if he hits you once, he will hit you again at which point her studio audience all stood up and applauded. The question is, is that true? Um, here we have Bobby Brown, who in 2003 was very high profile for assaulting Whitney Houston, arrested for misdemeanor battery on her, as well as drug possession, uh, driving under the influence and resisting arrest. Um, and here, going back a little bit more in time, we have Jim Brown, who in 1998 was arrested and charged with wife assault. That was later reduced to destruction of property, which was smashing the window on his wife's car. He refused treatment and did jail time. No domestic violence in the marriage since. That's 1998. And here we have James Brown. Uh, famous R&B entertainer, the godfather of soul, taught Michael Jackson all his moves, um, high on PCP, assaulted his wife, grabbed a shotgun, and led police on a half-hour chase across state lines. He was arrested and did 15 months. <clears throat> now, these are four very high-profile cases of domestic violence. How do they stereotype domestic violence perpetrators? Well, the most obvious way is every domestic violence perpetrator must be named Brown, right? Except for Ray Rice, and he wasn't part of this set. 
Secondly, they must all be African American. Thirdly, they must all be men. Well, actually, that's not what the data says. Here, by the way, just to prove that every African American man named Brown does not assault his wife, is Ray Brown, the famous jazz bassist who played with Dizzy Gillespie and Oscar Peterson and was happily married to jazz singer Ella Fitzgerald with no domestic violence. I just threw that in there so the stereotypes would take a hit. <clears throat> now, Francis Bacon said this um, back in 1620 in the New Organum. The human understanding, when it adopts an opinion, draws all things else to support and agree with it. And although there might be a greater number and weight of instances to be found on the other side, Yet these it either neglects and despises, or else by some distinction sets aside and rejects, in order that by this great and pernicious predetermination, the authority of its former conclusion may remain inviolate. This is what social psychologists call belief perseverance, okay? which means that once people form a belief, it doesn't matter how much the evidence contradicts it, they will stick with that belief through thick and thin. My other favorite forensic philosopher is Sherlock Holmes, and he said this, it's a capital mistake to theorize before one has the data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. So here's a book I wrote in 2006. I'd written two previous books that were sort of generic books on domestic violence research called The Domestic Assault of Women first edition, second edition. This was supposed to be Domestic Assault of Women, third edition. But when I read the research, I decided that it was time to rethink domestic violence, that it was not only about uh, female victims having domestic violence perpetrated on them by abusive males. Here's a, a column that Vancouver Sun columnist Daphne Bramham wrote three years ago. Um, pretty good columnist, except for this one. And in this particular column, this is what she says, that half of all women in BC either have been physically assaulted or sexually assaulted. She says that without giving a source for it. She says 60% of all women in shelters refuse to report abuse to police, that only 8% of domestic violence victims are men. And the only men who are domestic violence victims are either elderly or disabled. <clears throat> um, and then these stats are mixed in with three sensational horror stories of Radinder Bangu, who was hacked to death by her husband in Surrey, BC, a Rumana Mansour, who's a UBC scholar, blinded by her husband in Bangladesh, and Katropa Damon, who was stabbed to death by her husband in June of 2011. The unstated implication is that this is kind of routine domestic violence, although these three cases are obviously off the charts, especially when you compare them to the data she's talking about here, which is itself questionable. So as we know, BC Lions have been publicizing a campaign to stop violence against women. So that leads to a question about domestic violence. Is all intimate partner violence by men violence towards women? Or is it violence towards a woman? There's a big difference. For example, <clears throat> if you get into a fist fight with some guy over whatever issue in the street, and the police arrest you both, and it turns out the guy you got in the fist fight with was gay, you probably am not going to be accused of a hate crime for gay bashing because the fact that he was gay didn't matter, had no bearing on the fight. That same principle applies to domestic violence. Uh, is it politically motivated or is it motivated by something that is psychological, dysfunctional, pathological, but not really political? We see a lot of pop psychology these days. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Here was a pop seller that capitalized on the stereotypes. Uh, Oprah Winfrey TV show really plays a lot on this. <clears throat> so typically, Intimate partner violence is characterized as male perpetrated against a hapless female victim. And the original sociological view, which is called functional sociology, 
It says it serves a function in society. That function is to maintain patriarchy. That's why it's called violence against women. From a functionalist sociological point of view, it's every act of domestic violence is a political act. Um, so if you Google images of domestic violence, this is what you find, a guy with a belt and a woman cowering on the floor. And the question is, yeah, sure, bad stuff happens, but is this really representative domestic violence? It's typically presented as a male using severe violence, probably repeatedly, against a nonviolent female victim. That's the stereotype. And a lot of people have written a lot of books about this, really declaring it as a war. Okay. <clears throat> Once somebody declares war on something, you can be guaranteed all clear thinking has gone out the window. Okay. We saw that with the war on drugs. We see it with the war on women. Um, war seems to bring out the worst in our thinking. So <clears throat> here is essentially what is feminist sociology, which was the wave that, did, that drove the gender paradigm and influences all of our current criminal justice practice and thinking on domestic violence. The focus is on male violence in general towards women as a way of maintaining patriarchy. It's seen as normatively accepted in society. Uh, the entire emphasis is on gender relations and power. You'll notice there's no psychology in here at all. And <clears throat> here's a quote from Michelle Bograd, um, who talks about this perspective. She's one of these uh, feminist sociologists, and she says, all feminist researchers, clinicians, and activists address a primary question. Why do men beat their wives? <clears throat> Why men in general use physical force against their partners, and what functions this serves for a given society? So that's the functional feminist sociological point of view. And here <clears throat> from Dobash and Dobash, I know these might look dated to you, but trust me, <laughs> point of view has not changed. <clears throat> Men who assault their wives are actually living up to a cultural prescription that are cherished in Western society, aggressiveness, male dominance, and female subordination, and they're using physical force as a means to enforce that dominance. So there you have a clear statement of it. The <clears throat> domestic violence is males using physical force to enforce dominance in society. So from this point of view then, it's a socio-political act. And Catherine McKinnon wrote a book called Towards a Feminist Theory of State, uh, in which she claims early on in the book that sexuality is to feminism as work is to Marxism. And in, by this thinking, <laughs> women are the proletariat men are the bourgeoisie, and every act of intimate partner violence against a woman is now a political act. <clears throat> it's violence against women. Now, without getting into all the problems of trying to map an economic, political economic model onto what is essentially a psychological problem, uh, this sort of very boldly states the political underpinnings of the gender paradigm. And just to bring it up to date, here's the United Nations 1993 declaration uh, that StatsCan cites in its own definition, any act of gender-based violence that results in physical, sexual, or psychological harm, any act, including threats, um, counts okay. uh, as a political act. So who believes this? Well, everybody who makes their domestic violence policy. Prosecutors, social work faculty, advocates, judges, child custody assessors, police are taught to believe it. They're given a heuristic for domestic violence, which is to look for male perpetrators. And as we'll see in one of the studies I'm going to show you, couples who have a history of two-way violence back and forth and whose violence raises above a certain level on a certain night and who call the police will wind up with the man getting arrested, not with the woman being arrested. So, okay, covered that one. First question then, <clears throat> is this really acceptable? Because functionalist sociologists say, yeah, we, we tolerate this stuff. So here's a large study that was done in 2001 in the U.S. on a nationally representative sample. You can see it's a large sample size there, <clears throat> done by a random digit dialing. 
5,238 people, and the question is, is it okay for a man to hit his wife or girlfriend? And both men and, and women were asked this question. You know, well, is it all right for him to hit her to keep her in line? That, after all, states the functionalist sociological view. You've got to hit her to keep her in line. Sure, who's boss? Enforce the patriarchy. And an overwhelming 2% of men agreed with that statement. Not overwhelming. 1.8% of women agreed with that statement. Even if the woman hits him first, only 9.8% of men think it's okay to hit her. There is, in fact, not a norm saying that wife assault is acceptable. There's a norm of chivalry, which, for some strange reason, functional sociology fails to mention. Is it okay for a woman to hit her husband? Well, a little bit more agreement there, but still a minority of people who agree with that. In other words, the bottom line is there is absolutely no normative support for intimate partner violence. There's none. So anyone who suggests otherwise is blowing smoke. Okay. Now... <clears throat> Just how frequent is this stuff? Um, Daphne Bramham said half of all women in BC are going to be victims of either physical or sexual abuse. Um, and you know, we could just look at the police statistics, but let me just say off the top, for domestic violence accounted by the police, it first of all has to be reported. Somebody's got to pick up a phone and say it's happening. The police have to attend. Uh, the police have to decide that it's serious enough to record it. They have to decide who the perpetrator was, and then they write a report. And unless all those things happen, it doesn't get included in crime statistics. Okay, so crime statistics will dramatically underestimate the amount of domestic violence that goes on. So the way you get at this stuff is to use what's called a, a victim survey. And if you want to do a victim survey, you could ask people if they were victims of crime, but you still run into this problem whether they define whatever happened to them as a crime or not. So if they don't define it as a crime, they're going to say, no, it didn't happen. And again, you'll be underestimating the amount of domestic violence. Well, a sociologist at the University of New Hampshire, Murray Strauss, discovered a way to get around this. He developed something called the conflict tactic scale. And here's a preamble. So now they're going to ask people about things that go on in their family, and they're going to get a handle on violence, but they're coming at it from a very different perspective. Instead of forcing people to admit that they're victims of crime, which they might not think is true, they have this completely different preamble, that no matter how well couples get along, there's times when people have conflicts, and they also have different ways to settle their conflicts, which of these ways have you used in the following year? So this provides a very broad definition. It doesn't define these things as abuse. And it <clears throat> tells them that conflict is normative. It happens to everybody. So it's fine to report this. And then it asks people, it gives them this big shopping list of ways that they might have used to resolve the conflict. And you can see the first ones are very rational, reasonable ways to resolve the conflict. And then it gets down with item E uh, to what's called verbal abuse, things that are not productive and, in fact, seem to be more designed to hurt the other person's feelings. And then it gets to physical abuse with the yellow lettering there. <clears throat> now there's uh, things that someone does that constitute physical abuse and pushing, grabbing, and slapping on this original scale. And then when you get into the red lettering, you see that there's even more severe items, and the red letter is called severe physical abuse, and these are things that have some likelihood of causing injury. So with this scale, in 1975, Murray Strauss went back and surveyed the U.S. public. And there's a second scale. I won't spend a lot of time on it. It just has way more items, and it's more elaborate. Okay, but it's the same principle called the CTS-2. So it doesn't require a crime victim's self-definition, um, and it finds way more abuse than any police survey or any crime victim survey, 16 times more abuse 
So you'd think that being the case, <clears throat> that domestic violence advocates would love this scale. In fact, they hate this scale. In fact, when Murray Strauss reported data derived from the scale and won a prestigious medal from the American Sociological Association for doing it, the first two rows of people got up and walked out in protest because what he'd done was really a horrible thing. He reported his data as a social scientist. Doesn't get much worse than that. He actually reported his data. What was so bad about these data? <clears throat> they showed that women were as violent as men were. That's what was so bad about them. Um, and that's what caused the protest. So there's a, that's, we'll look in fact at what some incident statistics look like, but another thing that's important to know just off the top is that two thirds of all the reported domestic violence are those yellow lettered ones that we looked at. It's the less serious type, pushing and slapping. Uh, only one third of all the incidence rates are the more severe types. So, um, Basically, the initial surveys were done in the U.S. and they were done across all uh, layers of the population, all groups, all demographic groups, all racial groups. And the basic findings were these, and this is 1985, this survey was done, uh, that 87% of men, 80% of women, 85% of couples reported no form of intimate partner violence in the year preceding the survey. Um, for potentially injurious intimate partner violence, the rates are <laughs> zero. In other words, people reported none. 96.5% of men, 95% of women reported none in the year preceding the survey. And <clears throat> in other words, it's a very small group of people who reports any domestic violence at all. Um, and that's true for all demographic categories. It doesn't matter whether it's working class or middle class. It doesn't matter whether it's African American or white or Hispanic. You get that same statistic happening. So if you can't find any social structural category, like race, class, uh, socioeconomic status, <clears throat> that generates abuse in a majority of people, what are you left with? You're left with the fact that there's somehow some kind of difference between people who commit intimate partner violence and those who don't, who are drawn from within the same social category, i.e., there's a psychological difference. Now, that, of course, has not been something that functionalist sociology has wanted to admit. So, you know, there's an issue of control. I'm going to go over this pretty quickly. The bottom line is they don't find gender differences in the use of control. Um, Jan Stetz at the University of Washington has done a lot of these studies. A lot of these studies basically uh, you find with couples that control, trying to control the other partner is highest in the first year right after the marriage and then it settles down. Um, Fel Felsen and Outlaw did the same thing. Um, it's not really, in other words, the, the the, the sociological motive that people are using domestic violence for control, not verified by people who study control in uh, intimate relationships. It's, it's used by both members of the couple. In fact, in 1989, <clears throat> when they looked at power relationships in American families, they found that only, and they used something called the final say measure, which is to give the family 12 major decisions and who gets the final say on each one of these decisions. What they found is that 9.8% uh, 9 of couples were male dominant and 7.8% were female dominant. The rest all had shared power and control. They worked it out. Um, one person had their domain, one person had the other. So <clears throat> this notion of patriarchy, in fact, is just really not supported when you actually look, look at the data. Um, here's the Canadian General Social Survey 2004 it was unfortunately, a, uh, it, it used the crime victim, it dropped the, the crime victim fil uh, filter, but it did use the term perceptions of crime. So it's still defining these things as a perception of crime, which is a bit of a problem. But, and it also looked at measures of partner's control. And what they found, first of all, off the top, 
was 7% of all Canadian women and 6% of Canadian men reported one being victimized by intimate partner violence at least once in the past five years. So again, uh, compare that to, I mean, how can Daphne Bramham say 8% of men in the role elderly and disabled when she's got the Canadian General Social Survey available to her years before she writes the column? Um, and here are the questions on the Canadian Social Survey. You see they're the same kind of questions as on the conflict tactic scale. So that's what it looked at. So I'm just going to jump ahead. And one of the other things that was came out of the Canadian Social Survey, since it had this measure of control, it was able to assess what's called intimate terrorism, which is to be in a relationship with somebody who's using domestic violence against you in order to control you. In other words, they're terrorizing you. It's intimate terrorism. Um, and so in this particular survey, building in the control aspect with the reports of abuse, they found that 4.2% uh, of all women and 2.6% of all men reported being victims of intimate terrorism by their partner. Again, that's Canada-wide in 2004. So not 100% and zero the way that uh, it had been described. <laughs> and John Archer came out with this, <laughs> this study um, in 1999 where he looked at, this is called a meta-analytic study. Meta-analytic studies are advantageous. They take everything that's been done and they put them all together. And so you don't have to go from this thing of one study saying one thing, one saying the other, because they're all compounded. And a, a generic finding comes out of all studies that are, are put together. So he did a lift, a lift search and came up with this huge sample size. You can see here over 65,000 people and these are all studies that have assessed both male and female domestic violence. Um, 65,000, and he, he uses a statistic called D prime. And that tells you the amount of difference in the distributions of male violence and female violence. So for example, if there was a D prime of one, it would say that male violence was one standard deviation greater uh, than female violence. Here's what it looks like. Here's a very small D prime for the effects of aspirin on heart attacks. It actually does have a small effect, a D prime of 0.06, which means if you take two groups of people, one of them get an aspirin, one of them gets a placebo, the aspirin group have slightly fewer heart attacks when they're measured down the road, uh, but not that much, 0.06. That's about 1 20th of a standard deviation difference. Okay, so that's the key thing that's being used. And so what Archer found in this compilation of all these studies was the effect size for violence when the genders were compared was minus 0.05, very comparable to the D prime you just looked at, which was 0.06. What this says is that women across all studies are more violent than men. Not much, 1 20th of a standard deviation. Nevertheless, that's across 65,000 people. And women are somewhat more likely to be injured, one-sixth of a standard deviation, D prime of 0.15, and women are somewhat more likely to need medical treatment, 0.08, uh, about a 15th of a standard deviation. So, you know, when Archer came out with this study, which was the best methodological thing that had been done up to that point, there was, of course, a frenzy um, in the activist community trying to find ways to undercut the study. And of course, they really didn't have any ways to do it except to attack the conflict tactic scale, say it wasn't getting all the data, etc. We can talk about that one if you want. Um, some of the things that uh, have been used by people to support the gender paradigm are much weaker, much weaker methodologically than the conflict tactic scale. So Sarah Damaray, who is a Simon Fraser PhD, um, did work on this, what was called the PASC project. Partner Abuse is a, a, a journal that publishes specifically in the area of domestic violence. And they did something called the State of, the Knowledge, State of Knowledge Project uh, in 2012, which was to take everything, all the research that had been done up to that point, and put it together so we knew exactly where we stood on certain key questions. So Sarah here has done a combination of 750 studies, 
on intimate partner violent incidents. And then she reduced that down to the best, the methodologically best, 249 studies. So that's a huge amount of data. The sample size here of 135,000. Um, and looking primarily at past year rates, because those are the ones that are most reliable, our memories for the past year are best. Um, and what this tells you, over on the far left, there's what are called large population studies. So that's the entire nation. And the black bar is victimization of males. And the gray bar is victimization of females. The large population studies say males are victimized more. That's true also for university and college samples. And true also for clinical samples. The justice sample here was based just on one study, so I think that one is probably uh, not that telltale. But across all these different samples, males are victimized more by IPV, um, intimate partner violence. The last year victimization rate reported by women was 13%, by men it was 18%. Um, perpetration rates, now, <coughs> tricky thing here is the, for some reason she flipped this around so the black bars now are women and the gray bars are men. But the results are still pretty much the same. And it, by the way, it doesn't matter whether it's a man or a woman who's reporting on these surveys. The results don't change. So it's not just one gender uh, reporting things that are self-aggrandizing. It's just not happening that way. Um, again, in large population studies and other samples as well, women report more perpetration. In fact, the past year perpetration rates for women are 23%, for men 18%. Um, university populations, that's exaggerated somewhat more. Now, you know, you can say, well, it's, it's not such a big a deal when a woman does it because she doesn't have the same upper body strength. But in fact, the injury rates that we looked at there uh, didn't show a huge difference by gender. Men are, are getting hurt by these things as well. I'll, I'll show you one study that did look at um, injuries to males. So again, what Daphne Bramham said this, there are rare cases where men are the victims, about 8%. Most are elderly or disabled. In fact, what the data are saying is this, that... Um, the past year victimization was greater for men than it was for women. So the press routinely misreports the data, routinely, okay? Um, the only person in Canada who gets it right is Barbara Kay for the National Post. There's nobody else in Canada who will even look at the other stuff. <clears throat> this is an interesting study that Jan Stetz and Murray Strauss did, and I'll show you why. Uh, this was a survey, again, U.S. survey data, but what makes this interesting is they ask people about both victimization and perpetration, and they ask them about levels of violence. So here's the data on this one, and so I'll explain what this what this says. Um, you, know, you can see in the left-hand side there, it's got three different kinds of relationships, dating, cohabiting, and married, because they were interested in marriage structure. If you want to, you can focus on the married if you want. Uh, the main thing I'm in interested in here is not so much the, the structure of the relationships, but that bar across the top, because what it tells you is what the different patterns of violence are like. Um, see, it's not just one size fits all. One guy using severe violence against a nonviolent woman. That's in this one. Uh, it's sort of one, two, three, four, five, six from the left. M sub M F minor, or sorry, it should be male severe, female none. That would be the fourth one from the left. So it tells you what percentage of people who report domestic violence fall into each one of these different patterns. And the bottom line, when you start looking at all these and adding them all together, is this, that the most common form of domestic violence, when you actually measure the patterns, is bilateral domestic violence matched for level of severity. 
The second most frequent form <clears throat> is domestic violence where the female uses a more severe violence than the male. And the third most frequent form is a form where the male uses more severe violence than the female. Uh, you can do the math yourself on that one, but trust me, I've added it up. Uh, and this is not the only study that finds this. So, in other words, if you compare wife battering, which is in the right-hand column there, across the different relationships from the Stetson Strauss study, these are the numbers that you find. And if you compare that with husband battering, you see the numbers are much higher for husband battering than they are for wife battering. Even in the married group, it's 9.6 versus 5.7. And injuries, um, women are injured more, but not, it's not 100%, 0%. Now, interestingly enough, <clears throat> no survey ever done in Canada has ever asked people about both victimization and perpetration. Never been done. Politically incorrect. Now, politically incorrect in trying to get to the truth of what's going on, not the same thing. Um, so everything that's been done in Canada has asked women solely about victimization. Um, when victimization and perpetration are both assessed, you get a very different picture of domestic violence and one that has really different implications for what you want to do about domestic violence. So if we look at the percent of female victims who are also perpetrators, it turns out that in cohabiting relationships, it's 84%, and in married relationships, 73%. That's all bilateral patterns, overall patterns of female victimization. Um, so not like one person is doing it all, and the other person is just a passive recipient. This was the Center for Disease Control study that Whitaker published in 2007. Uh, again, it's a large sample, 11,370 people. The ages are 18 to 28 because it was a national longitudinal study on adolescent health, so they wanted people that fitted into that age range. <clears throat> but that's good because those are the peak ages for domestic violence. And the data that Whitaker came up with are virtually exact replications of Stetson and Strauss data in 1989. 24% of people reported some intimate partner violence. Half of them reported reciprocal violence. That was the most frequent pattern. When it was unilateral violence, 70% of the perpetrators were female. 30% were male. Exactly what Stetson Strauss found. Um, the other thing that is important from a policy point of view and totally overlooked, <clears throat> if you're interested in protecting women, is that most of the female injuries resulted from reciprocal intimate partner violence. Um, but as I say, that's not something we've ever looked at in Canada. So, right. Here, <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it, but here we've got five large surveys now, all done independently by independent researchers that, Two of them we just talked about, Stetson Strauss at the top, that was the National Family Violence Survey in the U.S., 1989. Second one, the Whitaker Survey for the Center for Disease Control, 2007. You can see the huge sample sizes in these surveys. Then there's three others, National Comorbidity Study in the U.S., the National Survey of Couples, National Youth Survey. And um, then when you get into the data, the left-hand column tells you the percentage of everyone in their sample that reported intimate partner violence. It varies somewhat because some of them deal with younger populations where the numbers will be higher. The, the next three columns tell you that for those people who reported intimate partner violence, how did it break down? Was it predominantly male violent, predominantly female violent, or was it bilateral match for level of severity? Um, when you combine these five independent surveys, a huge sample size now, around 20,000 or more, you get the same findings again. The most common form of intimate partner violence is bilateral, matched for level of severity, followed by female, predominantly 
more, more severe, followed by male more severe. So the wife battering stereotype is a stereotype, but it's not the most common form of intimate partner violence. Um, here you have it. Okay. Um, now, so this issue of mutuality is an important one because, first of all, the incident surveys are telling us that's the most common form. So shouldn't we be, like, planning that into our policy or something, how to deal with it? Uh, Deborah Capaldi and Lisa Serban, who both done longitudinal studies, Lisa Serban was part of the Concordia Longitudinal Survey, started back in the 1970s and following people from the 1970s right up to the present <clears throat> to see what happens with them. And both that one and the Oregon Youth Survey that Deborah Capaldi did came up with this concept of assortative mating. People who are sort of independently aggressive before they meet are drawn to other people who are as aggressive as they are, that similar aggressive people seek out similar others. That's one of the reasons why you get aggressive couples. Um, there's also couple interaction research that some have done at the University of Washington by Neil Jacobson and Gayla Margolin at the University of Southern California that looks at couple interactions and they find that couples who become violent fall into what are called coercion traps. Each one's trying to top the other one, they up the ante back and forth, and at some point the verbal abuse becomes physical. So there's a lot of independent forms of evidence that say uh, we should be focusing more on mutuality. But, of course, the, the political view doesn't fit that, so it hasn't been done. Then there's this question of repetition of assault. <laughs> like Oprah said, and unfortunately a lot of people get their information from her, if he hits you once, he'll hit you again. Uh, Feld and Strauss actually tested this because they went back one year later to people who'd been interviewed in the U.S. National Survey, both male and female, and they re-interviewed 835 of them who'd reported violence and 560 who had reported no violence as a control group in the original survey in 1985. And then they summed the data together from the male and female respondents. Again, there's no differences. That's typically what you get. But <laughs> then the question is, if it happened in 85, what would happen again in 86? And they found, this is the husband's severity. Uh, in year one across the top, it was none. Uh, there was, it happened once or twice. It happened three plus times. And then they looked at severe violence happening in year two. So you can see, you know, if you had someone who was repetitively using severe violence in year one, three, three plus times, then there was a 57% chance it would have happened in year two because they're starting to develop it habitually. But if it had been once or twice or none, uh, well, we'll focus on the once or twice because they were the ones that were hit in year one, then it's actually unlikely to recur in year two. Okay. Um, or the level was more likely to go down. So here you see those, those data. Only repeat offenders were the ones that were likely to recidivate. Now, interestingly enough, when you look at... Um, this is both members of the couple being violent now, okay? So we've got wife severity and husband severity uh, in year one. And this is the percent of couples who reported in year two. You can see the ones in the lower right, the 42%, um, those are the ones where both had used severe violence in year one. So in other words, if it's a two-way violence form, then those are the ones that are most likely to recur. Um, most likely recidivists, both members of the couple used severe violence in 1985, a 42% recidivism rate. If the husband only used it once or twice with a nonviolent wife, then the rate in 1986 was only 19%. So if you're really interested in getting into these couples, breaking into this pattern that can wind up in injury, um, you want to be focusing on the two-way couples. So the question then, you know, to go back to our Google image of uh, the stereotypic wife beating, um, this is a male using repeat severe violence against a nonviolent female victim. Uh, 
I actually did the math on this. Okay, so based on all these survey reports, um, males use more severe violence uh, in this percentage of the surveys, but only one third of it was severe. So I worked it all down, and uh, the bottom line is that the actual incidence of the stereotype of wife assault is 0.009%. It happens in about 9 out of 100,000 people in the population. That's what we're building our entire policy on, an event that happens 9 times out of 100,000 cases. Um, there's a whole line of research in social psychology on male-female differences, not physical differences, psychological differences. What are the trait differences between males and females? Are men from Mars and women from Venus? These studies keep finding the same thing. There's no difference on psychological variables between men and women. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you measure it. Here's some of the ones that they look at in this one. Intimacy, empathy, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, emotional stability, conscientiousness. No difference. There are stereotypic activities that are more common. Men are more likely to use to box, women are more likely to use cosmetics, but not in psychological traits. No differences on any personality traits. There are dimensions, not, uh, not categories. Also, Hyde did this study in 2005, the same thing, 46 meta-analytic meta studies, no difference. So why do we ride so heavily on this gender thing and make it the basis of our policy in domestic violence? Um, lesbian gay issues, uh, same thing. They are completely underserved by the gender paradigm because it doesn't include them. Okay, it's this stereotype of males hitting women, but actually this study of lesbians at Guanyat Lee in Arizona, uh, women who've been in prior relationships with a man and a woman, uh, they all said that they received more abuse in the relationship with a woman. Um, 350. So it's an issue uh, for sure in uh, lesbian and gay relationships as well, but they get no service for it. Um, now, the injury problem is an interesting one. I did a study at, years ago at VGH where we were trying to collect data to find out how many women who came into the emergency ward were there because of domestic violence. And the numbers were shockingly low, and so they basically sat on the study. Um, the, the only place I know of that asked men that question, how you got injured, is St. Paul's. Um, maybe because they have a, a gay population, I don't know. But here is one study that was done in Philadelphia in an emergency ward um, where they found 12.6% of all male patients in 13 weeks were there because they were victimized by domestic violence. They reported being kicked, bitten, punched, or choked. 37% uh, reported a weapon being used against them. The authors said the numbers would have been higher, but they have to stop counting after midnight uh, because of fiscal concerns, so they screened out major trauma cases. Um, the psychological consequences of domestic violence, the same for men as they are for women. I know men are programmed to say, I'm fine, there's nothing wrong, but when you actually delve into it, as Ann Coker did, uh, there's no difference. The, one of the more egregious outcomes of the gender paradigm is uh, in custody cases because here's two books that both of which were written for custody assessors and warning them to really be careful in, because the, the best interest of the child in mind here, you have to screen for child abuse. So the person you have to screen for child abuse is the man. See, Bancroft's book is called The Batterer as Parent. That's about a male, of course, and Peter Jaffe uh, wrote a book called Child Custody and Domestic Violence. The main theme of both these books is the prime custody assessors to expect denial in men accused of child abuse. And of course, if the man denies the abuse because he didn't do it, he's still going to be suspected because that's what men who commit child abuse do. They deny. So you've got the makings of a witch hunt here. Um, <clears throat> The theme of the books is that only male domestic violence is serious to women and children, that abusive men will be extra litigious uh, in court. Jaffe made that claim. I tracked it down. 
He cited another book that he'd written. It turned out the basis for the claim was that two people had mentioned that to him anecdotally outside a courtroom. That was the data basis for that claim. Jaffe, by the way, got the Order of Canada. Okay, just so you know. Um, the actual overlap of wife abuse and child abuse is 6%. So even if the woman has been abused, it doesn't mean it's going to happen automatically to the child. And there's hardly any overlap. Here, in fact, are the data on child abuse from a huge study done in the U.S. Uh, look at the numbers for this study. 718,948 investigations of child abuse. We're talking huge sample here. And who's the most frequent perpetrator of physical child abuse? The biological mother. 58% of the cases. There you see it. You get mother only added to mother and father and mother and other. You put them all together and the mothers are the most frequent perpetrator of physical child abuse. And Jaffe and Bancroft are telling people, screen the father and don't believe it if he denies it. That's the state of family courts in Canada. Okay, that's the state. Now, a few other notable findings. Uh, <coughs> Lynn McDonald did this study in Texas, reported in two separate papers, 2006-2009, uh, where she did an amazing thing. The only study done on battered women out of the probably 2,000 studies done on battered women in shelters, the only one ever done that asked battered women about their use of violence out of maybe 2,000 studies, and um, found that, the women, that these women predicted that their own violence towards the children, and these are women in shelters, so they're really an extreme group because studies that are done on women in shelters, so they, you know, they've got like 58 prior victimizations, so they're not representative, they're really extreme victims, but they use violence too against their children, and that's what, that's what McDonald found. That it was two and a half times, their children were two and a half times more likely to be exposed to maternal intimate partner violence than paternal intimate partner violence. Um, that does not enter into our studies. Uh, <coughs> Neil Jacobson, uh, they did a study at the University of Washington and I was consulting on the study and it was sort of an interesting study because they set up an experimental apartment in their, their psychology lab and they advertised for abusive couples and they brought them in and the instructions were that you have to argue about things that you have fights about at home and uh, they wired them all up and into polygraphs, uh, doing all these sort of readings, of their physiological reactivity. And so when the data came back, what they found is this. First of all, they're shocked by the women in the study because they said this, their quote was, if we'd been studying female violence, 40% of women in the abusive couples had used severe violence prior to coming to the lab. Um, uh, so... Interestingly enough, though, despite getting these results that show a, a lot of sort of reactivity and a lot of violence in the women in this study, Neil went on to write a book called Cobras and Pitbulls, which talked about two kinds of male abusers, which he then went on to sell on Oprah Winfrey's show and didn't talk about the female violence. Um, Ed Gondolf did a huge study on predictors of recidivism in males who are undergoing court-mandated therapy in 2000. And, and there, in the very fine print, uh, underneath one of the tables, you really got to pull a magnifying glass out to see it, is this statistic, that 66% of the women partnered to these guys who are in court-mandated treatment because they've been arrested and convicted of wife assault, 66% of the women report being physically aggressive toward their partner prior to his arrest, and 40% of them said that they, the women, had initiated the violence. Um, Cross-cultural studies on dating violence, same thing. 33 universities, 17 countries, women more aggressive. And in Canada, this, it, you can sort of tell which university it is here because one, two, three, four, five from the top is Canada, London. So reasonably, that's University of Western Ontario and Canada, Montreal. I don't know if it's McGill or University of Montreal. I think it's McGill because it's an English language, most of them. 
Um, but the bottom line is the female percentages you see over here in the right-hand column are all above 100%. Most of them, not all of them, but a lot of them above 100%. It means that university-age women are committing more dating violence than the males. So it's going on. Now, um, you know, the, so now we have the police and courts and, you know, the big push back in 1992 in BC was to move to mandatory, mandatory arrest, no drop policies uh, for police. Um, and the reason for it was they felt that too many battered women were dropping charges and, and not sort of carrying through with the prosecution. And they wanted to crack down on these guys. So they came up with these mandatory arrest policies. Um, the problem is, I'll show you this and I'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, here's a study that was done, a very large randomized study done in Milwaukee by Sherman and Burke in 1992. And what you see there is what's called a sort of time series in the survival analysis. Um, it tells you, uh, and what, what they had the police do was at random, when they were called to a misdemeanor, uh, domestic violence call, they would either arrest the man or they just give him a warning. And then they look to see down the road what has the best results in terms of preventing a recurrence of the violence. So the dotted line there is the arrested group and the solid line is the worn group. And uh, the proportion surviving, now uh, the higher that is, the better. Okay, that means that by surviving, they mean there's no recurrence of violence happening. So uh, higher the better. So you see initially the arrested group starts out with a slight advantage until you get about eight months in and then it crosses over and the warn group actually does better. Um, mandatory arrest, in other words, doesn't really accomplish what people think it's going to accomplish. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of other studies. Uh, Ibuzawa, Jerry Hodling, did one on the Quincy Family Violence Court. They found the same kind of thing, that women who had used the court uh, never used it a second time. They went back and resurveyed them and said, how come you're not using the court? <clears throat> and first of all, they discovered that these women were, had, had been re-victimized, but they weren't using the court. And the reason they weren't using the court was they just didn't want the hassle that <clears throat> they felt was being imposed on them by the criminal justice system response. And Rada Yenger at Yale found that domestic violence death rates were higher in U.S. states that had mandatory arrests than ones that did not. And her thinking again was that's because mandatory arrests sometimes creates more than the victim wants. And it doesn't, <clears throat> therefore, have the kind of protective power that its supporters uh, think it might have. Um, Okay. <clears throat> Denise Hines, by the way, fantastic. We finally have female researcher doing research on battered men. Okay, finally. Uh, <laughs> and so she did this. One of the initial studies that she did was this one, 302 men who called the domestic violence hotline for men in New Hampshire. And she, of this, this group, she found that 78.5% had been injured by the domestic violence. 35% had a severe injury, severe enough to require medical attention. 58% had signs of PTSD. And, <clears throat> told, and when they called the local shelter, domestic violence program for help, 64% were told that they were the real batterer. So you've got this guy now who's been beat up, injured, has PTSD, and now he's being told he's the real batterer. You know, there are no provisions for men in Canada. I mean, the government has let Canadian men down everywhere. Earl Silverman, who I dedicate this talk to tonight, uh, out of his own pocket set up a shelter house for men in Calgary and spent 10 years trying to get funding and, and never got it and wound up committing suicide. He was just so burned out by the whole process. He couldn't take it anymore. Um, so that's the situation for men in Canada. Now... Uh, Oh yeah, one last one, I mean, it's sort of more of the same, but Deborah Capaldi was doing this Oregon Youth Survey, 
And so she's following these people over a long period of time. So instead of just a snapshot, she kind of knows what's going on in the relationship. So she does all these various assessments and has the police records and everything. And basically she finds that she's got these bilaterally violent couples, but the violence gets a little bit more severe at one time. And then when arrest is made, 85% of the people arrested were male, even though they're bilaterally violent couples. And that the men who were arrested were actually less aggressive than their female partners. She had long-term data, not just the police data, and that's why you can't really trust police data on these things. Okay. Um, how'd that get in there? Well, here's one more. Battered woman syndrome, okay? Um, here we've got Jody Arias' case, which I don't know if you've followed it or not, but it's been going on in Arizona, and two parts to it. In part one, she was found guilty of driving from her home in California to her boyfriend's home in Phoenix and stabbing him 29 times, slitting his throat and shooting him in the head, killing him, I might add. Um, and when the police investigated this, her first story to them was she wasn't there when he died. And then when they pointed out to her that they had video cameras showing she was there when he died, she said, yeah, she'd been there, but some other guys had come in and killed him. And when they pointed out to her that nobody else showed up in any of the security footage anywhere in the house, she said she had battered woman syndrome, and it was battered woman self-defense. Now, to the credit of the jury, they didn't buy this. And so now she's facing a penalty phase, which possibly will have a death penalty. Um, there was an original death penalty phase, and the jury hung eight to four, and it was a hung jury, so they had to try it over again. The new one is supposed to open anytime soon. Um, she keeps firing her lawyers. Now, the reason I mention that case, American case, is in Canada, we have this case of Nicole Ryan, the Golden Set, who alleged in court she was subjected to repeated abuse and torment by her husband. Uh, and the trial judge accepted her word on that, although she presented no corroborating evidence and her husband was never called to testify. And um, <clears throat> around 2007, she started to think about having her husband murdered, so she went shopping for a hitman. Um, <clears throat> in December 2007, she paid one man 25000 to carry out the killing, but he refused and demanded more compensation. She winds up finding another hitman, only unbeknownst to her, he's undercover RCMP. The undercover RCMP guy videotapes his conversation with her where she's offering him money to kill her husband, in the midst of which the RCMP guy says to her, he abused you, right? And she said, no, just want him dead. Okay. Um, guilty? No. No, 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 no. Um, charged with counseling the commission of an offense, but never found guilty. The prosecution appealed that, but really didn't get anywhere. It went up to the Supreme Court of Canada, and they said, you poor dear, you've suffered enough. So, bottom line, if Jody Arias had whacked her boyfriend in Canada, she'd be a free woman today, not looking at a death penalty. Because if you pull off uh, battered women self-defense in Canada, you don't really need to provide much evidence. I happen to know this stuff because I'm an expert witness in American courtrooms, and I know what evidence is weighed in cases of this sort. And in fact, I've testified in Canada on behalf of a battered woman, and it was, in my view, a legitimate case, and she won it. But look <laughs> at these other cases that are going on. Uh, you just have to say you're a battered woman, and that's it. Um, the gender paradigm has really gone a long way. In Ryan's case, no abuse was ever proven in court. Okay, and the husband never did testify. <laughs> um, Jeremy Swanson, who is a, a male activist, a men's activist in Ottawa, I've never met him, but he emails me all the time, and he claims, I'm giving, a, I, as the news says, I can't verify this, but anyway, he claims that, 
uh, that uh, there was a statement made to 50 assembled domestic violence feminists, 13 supporting men, and him, who happened to be present, he doesn't say how he snuck in, but by a judge, uh, Ontario Superior Court Judge Judith Beeman, July 27, 2008, courtroom 37 in the Ottawa courthouse, she said, luckily in Canada, we don't need evidence to have a man charged with domestic violence. Okay. Now, I'll just wind up with this one. Perceptions of domestic violence. Susan Sorensen is a psychologist in Los Angeles. Um, she did this huge survey in four different languages, nearly 4,000 adults in the LA area. And she gives them five vignettes, so they all describe a domestic violence incident. And the only thing that's changed in some of these vignettes is the gender of the perpetrator and victim are changed. The vignette is identical apart from that. And she also varies things like what the vignette depicts. It depicts physical violence. Some of them depict psychological violence. These things are all counterbalanced, so you don't draw any erroneous conclusions. Um, bottom line was this, that uh, across vignettes, if a male does to a woman exactly the same thing as in the other vignettes where the woman did it to the man, uh, it's judged as more likely to be illegal, that the police should be called, the assailant should be arrested and should serve jail or prison time, and a restraining order should be issued. Um, but these are for identical acts, okay? Identical acts. Um, some of these acts were physical, others were psychological. Um, and it didn't matter whether it was men or women that were making the judgments on this, you got the same results. So men have bought into the gender paradigm too. Diane Fallingstad did the same study with psychologists. I'd like to think psychologists know better, but no. Um, two scenarios describing context of psychologically abusive behaviors given to 449 clinicians, median age 52, and same deal. Um, psychologists rate male perpetrated behaviors more abusive and severe than the wife's use of the same actions and contextual factors don't affect the tendency. Uh, the way Diane Fallingstead put it was this way, she said the stereotypical association between physical aggression in males appears to extend to an association of psychological abuse in males. Um, and <laughs> it's interesting that at universities, everybody knows about stereotyping of all ethnic groups, all racial groups, and of women, but they do not get that males are stereotyped. They do not get it. People understand stereotyping as it impacts on the group to which they belong, but they do not understand stereotyping when it's used on another group. A study by Glick et al. found that males were stereotyped in 16 countries, seen as warrior-like and power-driven with ambition over compassion, even though the average enrollment in police and military duties across those countries was fewer than 1% of males. Now, you know, so just to wind this up, Daphne Bram had three horror stories in her, in her story on domestic violence against men. And here's one uh, from September 2011. Um, this woman dr drugged her husband, cut off his penis. Uh, Catherine Q, uh, she was convicted of torture and aggregated, aggregate, aggravated may mayhem. Easy for me to say. Um, and she has a website of Facebook followers who believe she should be set free. Larissa Schuster dipped her husband into a vat of acid, uh, hydrochloric acid. Police only found the liquefied remains and bragged about her abusiveness to her manicurist saying it's better than sex. Um, the prosecution played telephone messages of her berating her husband. And then Joyce Gregory, who squeezed a man's testicles from his scrotum, um, charged with malici malicious castration. Now, the point here is, I could do a column like Daphne Bramham did in the Vancouver Sun that just focused on the statistics of violence against men and didn't report any statistics of violence against women um, and then put it together with three sensational cases like the three I just showed you. And there is actually a technical definition of this. It's called propaganda. And that's what propaganda does. It inflates data, 
It combines less serious cases with very, severe case, very serious cases. So in the person's mind, they're associating these things, thinking it all goes on. Um, and what we get, for the most part, of reports of domestic violence in Canada is propaganda. Um, actually, if you look at domestic violence, the main cause is not patriarchy, it's a coercion trap, it's couples who don't know how to deal with uh, conflict very well. There are some psychological predictors that have to do with attachment disorder. There's no one psychological cause, but there's a combination of them. But it definitely is not gender. So Eileen Gambrill wrote the book on propaganda, which I reviewed for a journal, and uh, propaganda equals sophistry equals truthiness. It, people kind of will take it for being the truth. It appears logical. It stretches or cherry picks the data and combines them with sensational horror stories, but it's not the truth. So we've got, in other words, a lot of bad consequences of the gender paradigm, not the least of which is the so-called Duluth model, which they use uh, for <laughs> men who've been convicted of domestic violence. And uh, this was written by people who didn't know anything about psychology. They didn't know anything about therapy. They have the faintest idea how to do therapy with men who've been convicted of wife assault. And I love this one quote because this is the one that runs their view of what should happen in the Duluth model group. Using slavery, a colonial relationship, or an oppressively structured workplace as an example, the facilitator can draw a picture of the consciousness of domination. That's to show these guys how horrible they've been just for being male. Um, okay. That's just more. Well, we talked about those. All right. <laughs> the. Uh, by the way, Washington State evaluated the Duluth treatment model, and the effect size is near zero. It, it not only doesn't work, it cannot work. It cannot work. I mean, it's equivalent to brainwashing used in the Korean War. Um, those things do not have lasting effects. So, you know, there's this whole thing about paradigms. You know, there are sets of social beliefs that get created. I have a few ideas about how this current one got created. Uh, politically, it was perfect. It fit, fitted into the notion of uh, women's liberation. And it did this by equating domestic violence with a political act, so with violence against women. And nobody really is against women's equality. I mean, there's not much evidence in any polls that anybody is against women's equality, not in North America. Maybe the Taliban or somebody is, but not in North America. Um, but in the minds of people in North America, domestic violence is somehow an affront to women's equality. So that's the brilliance. And the brilliance is that right-wing uh, political parties love this because it's consistent with their view of family values. And left-wing parties love it because it's consistent with their view of women's equality. So politicizing it this way has had... Tremendous payoff, except it's not the truth. Just flat out not the truth.